like some of you, I began teaching before the era of one-to-one programs and even before cell phones were common. And I remember as students began to get iPhones and smartphones, the challenge that that presented me in my classroom, managing that technology on top of everything else that you have to manage in a classroom setting. The idea of handing every student in your classroom a fully web-capable device should terrify you a little bit. While there's a lot of great stuff on the internet and technology, especially Chromebooks, can open up wonderful learning opportunities, they can also represent a tremendous distraction. In this video, we're going to look at some classroom management techniques to help you manage your technology simply and easily. Technology can be amazing or it can be very distracting. These are practical tips, some that require no special software or hardware, they're not even device tips, and then others that will require some um, intervention by your IT department. These and many other tips uh, can be found in my book, The Chromebook Classroom. You can get a free chapter by visiting chrmbook.com or uh, just head over to Amazon and uh, search for the Chromebook Classroom. Now the first way that you can manage technology is super, super low tech, and that is to put the tech away. The easiest way to manage technology is to have a clear policy in a given class period of yes, we are using computers or no, we are not. The gray area is when problems typically come up. Um, specifically, if you have a lesson where maybe you're going to use the technology for five, 10 minutes, and then you're not going to use it for the rest of the class period. The time that those devices are out but not being used is where distractions and problems can occur. So whenever possible, I would encourage you to either plan a lesson around technology and plan on using it for the entire class period and have a very specific reason that technology is being used. Or if the lesson doesn't need technology, just put it away. Like there should be no technology out. That is the simplest, easiest uh, policy to enforce. Now, another uh, tip that you can um, proactively uh, look at is to adjust your room layout. Now, I recognize that for some of you, this may not be possible. I was a science teacher, and so for me, I couldn't do this either. You know, I had water lines and gas lines that I had to um, deal with. But if you're using technology, especially in a one to one program, it really eliminates the front and the back of your classroom. Um, using tools like Pear Deck or Cast for Education, you can directly cast and display information like your presentations onto a student screen, which eliminates the need for them to all be facing the same direction. When students are clustered more in pods, kind of like the image that you see um, on the screen, it makes it easier for you to monitor what students are doing. So you, you know, you could step in any corner of uh, this room and see a large percentage of the student screen, which allows you to hold them accountable. So consider your room layout if you have that uh, ability. Next, I want to encourage you to clearly define what your class expectations are. There's some common questions you're going to get. You've probably heard all of these. One of the most frequent ones that I receive is, can I listen to music while I work on my project? Um, most students will head over to YouTube to do this. YouTube is the probably the simplest way for students to get access to music. Um, do you care? Yes or no? I mean, that's your choice. That's your policy. Perhaps your school has a policy, but it's important to set that expectation clearly so that there's no confusion. Um, is it okay for students to browse the web uh, if they finish their work before the period ends? Um, are you allowing them to chat or message other students, whether they're in or out of uh, the class? Can they check sports scores or news? I mean, keep in mind that students are people, they have interest, things are going on in the world they may want to check up and look into. Just have a clear policy. Um, your students will appreciate it. They may not like the policy, but at least they'll know what it is. Um, and then finally, can they do homework in other classes? Uh, you know, some some school districts have very clear policies for the entire school. Some leave it up to teachers to decide. So clarify and clearly communicate what your expectations are. 
Now, one recommendation uh, that I have for you, and this is especially helpful at elementary and middle school levels, is to put together a list of what I call free time activities. So if you don't want your students playing games or going to ESPN or browsing Amazon or whatever they want to do, you need to give them a productive option in place of those things. And so I have developed a couple of uh, lists of activities. These are websites that are fun yet educational uh, that they can explore. Uh, things like AutoDraw by Google, um, GeoGuessr, Typing Practice, Free Rice. Uh, there's, there's many more and you can add your own to that list as well. Again, we want a clear policy and so you can set up uh, a rule in your class that says if you finish your work before the end of the class period and you have extra time, you may pick any activity from the free time activity list to uh, do until the bell rings. I recommend posting that free time activity into Google Classroom. Um, I usually create a new topic in the stream or excuse me, in the classwork page just called class resources and post it there. It's a Google Doc so I can add to it throughout the year as uh, new things are discovered. The number one way that you can keep students accountable for their technology usage is to be engaged with them. Um, I know it is tempting, and look, I'm not here to judge. I'm, I was a teacher too, and the paperwork piles up. You've got a stack of papers to grade. You've got IEPs to review or, or whatnot. And while it's tempting to you know, get them working on a project, independently and then go sit at your desk and work on those other um, tasks, you really need to be engaged with them, walking around the room, asking them questions, um, monitoring, and just being present with them. If your students think that you're going to check out and don't really care, that's when you're going to have uh, trouble. So being up and active is one of the best ways to manage your students' technology use. Along those lines, there's a couple of recommendations that I have. You want to eliminate anonymity whenever possible. Um, when students believe that they can browse or um, do things without being tracked or monitored, they're much bolder in their actions. And so there's several things you can do, especially on a Chromebook, to eliminate um, the secrecy of what they're doing. So the first, and some of these will require um, your IT department to enable these settings. They may already uh, be there. You can check. Um, the first I would do is to disable guest mode. So on a Chromebook, when you get them out of the box and you, you get to that sign-in screen, you have the ability to sign into your account or there's a little option that says browse as guest. Browsing as a guest gives a student access to the web, but they're not signed in. Therefore, you can't track or trace what they're doing or where they're going. Um, and so it's anonymous, which I don't recommend. Um, now, the second thing to do is if you've blocked guest mode, a student can sign into their account, but Google Chrome has a feature called incognito mode that is for private browsing. Um, and that's something that I would recommend disabling for student accounts as well. Um, if you're not sure, ask a student. They'll let you know if it uh, is available. Um, you can also, on a Chromebook, disable a student's ability to clear their browser history. There are precisely zero reasons that a student would need to go in and erase their browsing history. Uh, legitimate reasons, uh, that is. Um, and then finally, when it comes to assignments um, in Google Drive, I never encourage uh, the use of anonymous editing. You know, I've tried it, you know, I've done anonymous surveys and course evaluations, and the reality is when a student is anonymous, they do not do their best work. I always make students sign their name to their work simply by logging into their account. I share it with them. If you're using Google Classroom, this will be taken care of uh, for you. You can always go into the revision history to see every comment in uh, um, you know, text that has been entered into that slide presentation, Google Doc, um, et cetera. So these are a couple of uh, you know important things for you as a teacher. The anonymous editing tip is really the only one that you have direct control over. The other uh, three listed on here would require um, assistance from your IT department to configure. Now, the reason that we are going to block 
anonymous browsing is because you have the ability to verify the um, actions of your student while they're in class with you. This is a pretty slick um, tool uh, feature here. This is a standard feature of the Chrome browsers, not specific to Chromebooks. So if you, um, you know, walk up to a student and as you approach them, you see them frantically closing all of the tabs that they had open so that you don't know where they've been, all you have to do is press three keys on their keyboard, Control, Shift, T. Pressing those three keys at the same time will reopen recently closed tabs. Now, if you continue to press it, you'll open up all of the subsequent tabs that they recently closed. This is a pretty powerful thing. I mean, I use it personally, you know, all the time. You accidentally close a tab and you're like, oh, shoot, I wish I had that open. Control Shift T will reopen it. You can literally see every tab that a student has viewed since they came into your class and logged into their Chromebook. This feature works as long as you've disabled incognito mode, clearing browsing history, and you know, all those other things that I've mentioned. So it's a great in-class accountability tool. You don't have to ask your IT department to look at a student's browsing history. Um, it's it's already there. Now this is it has its limits. Um, this is kind of like a temporary history. So once a student logs out of their Chromebook, that temporary history. Um, gets erased. Now it is in their permanent history, but you don't have access to that. Uh, you'd have to ask your IT department to go in and pull a student's uh, browsing history. So this is just a kind of an in-class return. I just tell my students, hey, you're on a student, uh, a, a student device owned by the school. We know what you're doing. We trust that you're going to do the right thing and we have methods of verifying that. So please do the right thing. We won't have any trouble. Um, it only takes a couple of times to use this for students to understand that they leave digital footprints wherever they go. Now, everything that I've shared with you so far is where I start with. Um, most issues I feel that you can resolve and manage through all of the tips that I have just shared with you. The tips I've shared do not cost anything. Many of them are more procedural uh, things than technology things. If you still feel that you need more tools to monitor student activity, there are many tech management um, monitoring tools available. Um, these will allow you to like see a snapshot of what every student is looking at on their screen, automatically close tabs, open tabs for them, things of that nature. Um, the one that seems to come up the most and uh, people seem to really like is Go Guardian, uh, which is which is a great tool. Um, Class Hub is another one that I'm familiar with. Land School, Hapara, these are all tools that will give more control to the teacher beyond what I've mentioned so far. Now, the downside to these is that they're not free. Um, each one of these does require a school subscription. You know, we're talking thousand dollars and up depending on the size of your school. So this has to be something that you really feel that you need and that teachers throughout the district are going to use. It's not something that just a teacher can uh, sign up for. It will require your IT department to configure and set these tools up um, in order to get them running. The last uh, thing that I'll just mention um, is to you know know your web filter. Schools are required by U.S. federal regulation to have some means of monitoring student browsing activity and blocking inappropriate sites. Um, the rules governing this are very vague and broad, which is good. Um, it really just means that a school has to have some method of blocking explicit sites. It doesn't say what they have to block or how they block it, it just has to have something. Every school that I've ever worked with has some kind of a web filter that uh, will do that. The goal here is to block the most explicit and inappropriate content. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, look, this is kind of like cheating in schools. If a student really wants to bypass the web filter, they're going to figure out a way to do it. Um, but as pretty much everybody has discovered, you can do a seemingly innocent web search and get shocking results. So a good web filter will block those 
uh, inadvertent uh, search results that may be presented. There are many web filters out there. I'd encourage you to know what you have and how it works um, and how to adjust those settings or you know ask your IT department to do so. Um, one web filter that I would recommend is Securely. Um, and the reason that I recommend this one is it is free. Um, it is a wonderful product, but their Chromebook solution is 100% free for schools. Now, if you have iPads and Windows devices, other things, you need to pay for uh, filtering those devices, but the Chromebook filtering is uh, is free. Securely is great. Um, I have a um, I interviewed the CEO of Securely on my podcast and kind of got his take on um, student security. Um, if you're interested in that conversation, you can head over to my website, chrmbook.com slash podcast and uh, look for uh, the interview uh, with Securely. So that's, you know, that's not something that you as a teacher will have direct control over, but it's good to be aware of what your filter is and how it works. Technology can be a wonderful tool when used appropriately. As teachers, we need to make sure that we have policies and controls in place and are aware of the tools available to us to make sure that the technology in our classroom is being used effectively.